I'd like to introduce you to Phil Gregory, uh, one of the most interesting people on Bowen Island, and I think that uh, you'll be more interested in his adventures when you hear what he has to say tonight. All yours. Well, that was a remarkable introduction. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for coming out to listen to this talk. I plan to speak for about 45 minutes. I, I usually like to defer questions until the end of the talk, uh, but if there's a point of clarity, by all means, ask away. I'm not going to give a very mathematical talk, so if you miss one equation, it won't much matter. <laughs> You'll be hard-pressed to find one. So let me start with what triggered me out of my astrophysical comfort zone. We all have our comfort zones. And, and so let's start with that. So here it is. This appeared in Scientific American in uh, December of 2014. And it's an announcement by the United Nations that there are only 60 years of farming left if soil degradation continues. I subsequently learned that uh, in the UK has estimated that they've only got 30 years of fertile soil left. So this completely surprised me. I was well aware of climate change and the dangers that posed, but this uh, came out of the ballpark. Bearing in mind that we have 14 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, I needed to step up to the plate and see what I could do to find out, is there a solution? So I've been investigating for the last seven years, six of them leading up to the publication of my book where I present what I've found. So what are the primary causes of soil degradation? Plowing or tilling, chemical intensive farming, current livestock management, deforestation, industrial and urban land use. So the first three are clearly agriculture. The fourth one is probably agriculture as well because we cut down forests to grow grains to feed livestock. So this really pointed the way that agriculture itself was responsible for the soil degradation. Here's another way of looking at soil degradation. For every ton of food produced, we lose seven tons of topsoil. Now, the seven tons is what we call a median figure. That's 50% of the measurements are higher than that, 50% are lower than that. The average is more like 19 tons. If there's a long tail to the distribution, the average will be way out away from the median. So this just uh, says it all as far as I'm concerned. So what's happening to the farmers? What's happening to Canadian farmers in particular? Here's a graph that was uh, constructed by Darren Qualman, who's a farmer, Canadian farmer, and author of Civilization Critical which came out in 2019. So what are we seeing on this graph? There's, there's two curves. So the upper curve is the total gross revenue for all Canadian farms. This data comes from Statistics Canada. And you can see on the vertical axis there, we go from zero to $70 billion. And Clearly, the revenue, the gross revenue, that's what the farmers receive when they sell their produce, uh, is marching fairly steadily upwards. Well, there's some big hiccups in there, but it's a progression upwards. Now, what does the farmer get to keep in his pocket? That's the net income, and that's shown by the lower curve. And you can see that for the first half of the last century, the farmer was capturing about 50% of the revenue, putting it in his pocket. But then starting in about the 1980s, that collapsed. And so from 1985 to 2019, the farmer has only been able to put 3% of the revenue in his pocket. 97% of the revenue is captured by the large corporations that provide all the inputs. What are those inputs? Well, a big input is fertilizer. 
Another input is seeds, most of which are genetically modified now. So the farmer can't actually buy those. They have to sign an agreement with the seed company. And then there's pesticides and herbicides, fungicides, and fuel costs, equipment costs, and then a lot of things associated with banking charges uh, and accounting fees. So basically, the corporations have succeeded in channeling essentially all of the farm revenue into their pockets with a narrative that you can't grow anything nowadays unless you use our chemicals and you buy our seeds and you spray everything with our pesticides. So the farmers clearly are growing broke. Most of them have off-farm incomes, but the prognosis is not good. One can forecast fairly reliably that they're so deeply in debt, and here's the farm debt right now, it's 115 billion. Now, I haven't included, or Darren didn't include, he subtracted it off, the subsidies that the government pays the farmer. They amount to about 3.4 billion a year on average. But by having those subsidies in, it makes the farmer's situation look more promising. But it's artificial money. It's not anything they've sold. It's not anything they've created. So altogether, since 1985, the subsidies have been 119 billion. And farm debt is comparable, 115 billion. So if you're getting precious little, 3% on your effort, and you're way in debt, the predictions are not very difficult to do here. So this is really not good. So according to Qualm, and that's the author here, industrial agriculture replaces nature's diverse circular systems with simplified linear systems where we push huge quantities of fossil fuel-based inputs in at one end and food out the other end, along with greenhouse gases, eroded soil, chemical runoff, toxicity, depletion, loss, and extinction. So the question remains, is there another way? This doesn't seem sustainable at all to me. And so that's what I set out to investigate. Here are the topics I studied in my six-year investigation, all to do with how we grow our food, and its impact on biodiversity, human health, and climate change. It was actually fascinating for me. I love doing research, and uh, because I'm a, a retired faculty member, I have access to all the world's libraries. I don't have to pay anything to do this. So, yeah, I'm just uh, in my heyday learning new things. One of the most important things I learned was that an invisible world of microbes is the secret behind healthy soil. There's been a quiet revolution going on for the last 30 to 40 years in soil biology. And it's basically, there's been a revolution in our understanding of soil biology and also about nature's complexity. And one of the big things that's turned up is the world of microbes. They include a huge diversity of bacteria, fungi, and other microscopic predators that are key to understanding the biological systems nature evolved to make living soil to support healthy plants and animals. Regenerative agriculture provides a way. It provides a way to partner with nature's biological systems to rebuild the soil fertility and sequester atmospheric carbon at the same time as we grow food. And interestingly enough, this approach enables landscapes to renew themselves so we can actually reverse soil degradation. Well, in 2021, I wrote up my investigation and published this book called Pathway to Regeneration. And uh, there's a website there. I will make this PowerPoint available so it'll be on the Rotary Club page. And yes, uh, I brought along uh, some signed copies of the book. I'm selling it for $30, and it's for a fundraiser for our BIFS activities. So if you want to support BIFS, you can buy the book, and you can walk away with all the details that you might want to know about. 
So the good news, and in this 40 minute presentation, I'm not gonna be able to give you all the justification for this, but hopefully you'll find it all in my book. If we transform to regenerative agriculture where we work with nature, we can, one, rapidly reverse soil degradation, two, avoid the looming collapse of agriculture. These are brave claims. Three, reduce chronic disease epidemics. And four, go a long way to solving global warming. Although we still need to rapidly reduce fossil fuel emissions. Neither one will get us there. So what I'd like to do now is start with an animation which comes from Dr. Elaine Ingham's Soil Food Web School. Dr. Ingham is a pioneer in this revolution of soil biology that I referred to. She and three other teammates wrote a very influential paper in 1985, which for the first time really explored what do these microbes do for us in the way of growing plants? What roles do they have? This, this paper was basically a prime catalyst to this revolution that really got underway in 1991. I enrolled in and took the four foundation courses that she offers in soil biology. And this is where I learned a lot of this stuff. Anyway, to uh, attract more students, because what her objective is, is to train soil food web consultants that then can go out and help farmers move from industrial agriculture to regenerative agriculture. I just took the theoretical stuff, the coursework. I didn't do the practicum. I didn't you know, qualify for being a soil food web consultant. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I've used this with elementary school students. And the last time I did it, some of the students said, wow, that was the easiest learning I've ever had. And so I thought to myself, well, maybe I should try it out on an adult audience. So <laughs> I'm sorry, you're guinea pigs. <laughs> Great. What is the soil food web? To understand the soil food web, let's start with the term food web. We all know about the food chain, the animal kingdom on top of which are us humans, right? Well, if we look a little closer, we can see that some members of the food chain don't just eat one thing. That goes for humans too. So the reality is more like a web than a chain. This is the food web. There happens to be a food web in the soil too. This is the living part of the soil made up of insects, earthworms, and much smaller microscopic creatures such as fungi and bacteria. Dr. Elaine Ingham has pioneered research into the microorganisms in the soil over the last four decades and has worked with a team of research scientists to understand how they interact with each other and with plants. The soil food web can be thought of as the soil biome. Just as humans have a gut biome, responsible for digesting our foods, so too the soil has a biome, which breaks down organic matter and releases nutrients in plant-available form. This is how nature has been feeding plants for billions of years. The major groups that make up the soil food web are bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. When in balance, these different groups interact with each other and with plants, to create abundant ecosystems such as the great forests of the world. Have you ever wondered how forests can be the most productive ecosystems in the world without the need for any fertilizers or pesticides? The answer lies in soil biology. With a healthy biome, the soil can provide plants with all the nutrients they need. And with a number of other benefits, such as protection from pests and diseases, protection from drought and from flooding, the soil food web is, essentially, nature's operating system. Unfortunately, we humans have disturbed the soil food web in almost all of the soils that we manage, causing it to become unbalanced. As a result, the plants we grow struggle. Plowing is the major cause of the problem, as it destroys the larger microorganisms, such as fungi and protozoa, leaving the soil food web out of balance. This results in a system breakdown. Nutrients are no longer made available to plants, and protection from diseases is compromised. Before the Industrial Revolution, humans would plow using oxen or a bull, which provided around 3 or 4 horsepower. Modern tractors can yield 400 horsepower or more. So far more damage is done to the soil biome by modern machinery. The use of chemicals has compounded the problem. 
The good news is that we can restore the soil food web to most soils within just a few months. This results in a number of benefits, both for farmers and for the environment. With a balanced soil food web in place, farmers need not use fertilizers at all. They don't need to use pesticides either, as nature's operating system protects plants from attack. Herbicides, used to kill weeds, are not required either, as weeds only thrive in conditions where the food web is out of balance. Restoring the soil food web means farmers save money on chemical inputs across the board. It also means that their yields increase dramatically. In some cases, farmers working with Dr. Elaine Ingham have seen yields increase by over 200%. This is because the soil food web provides plants access to a constant flow of nutrients from soil organic matter and from the soil particles themselves. That's right, sand particles contain nutrients, and guess what? Fungi and bacteria can harvest those nutrients. They then make these available to the plant in a process that the plant actually controls. This means that plants get access to the type of nutrients they need precisely when they need them. That's how you maximize yields and optimize profits. For the environment, there is a whole host of benefits of having a balanced soil food web. Humanity is facing a number of existential threats. Let's take a look at how some of these are related to the soil. The most obvious one is soil erosion. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has estimated that we only have around 60 years left before all the world's topsoil is depleted. Other estimates are as low as 30 years. The soil food web prevents soil erosion by both wind and water by building structure. Please watch the animation on soil structure for more information. Another existential threat we are facing is ecosystem collapse. The UN has recently stated that insect populations have been decimated by around 25% each decade for the last 30 years. That means that there are 57% less insects today than there were in 1989. Bird populations have declined by one-third in the last 15 years in parts of Europe. So how does the soil food web help? Well, the UN has identified the use of pesticides as a major cause in the decline of insect populations. Please watch the animation on pests and diseases to find out how nature's operating system protects plants against attack eliminating the need for pesticides. Another threat to life on Earth is climate change. Fortunately, the soil is capable of holding tremendous amounts of carbon in the bodies of microorganisms, and some mega-organisms too. The biggest living organism in the world is, not a whale, it's a fungus found in Oregon that is the size of 1,665 football fields. It is between 2,000 and 8,000 years old, and it is made mostly of carbon. By restoring the soil food web, we could put a stop to climate change. Please watch the animation on soil carbon sequestration for more details. At the Soil Food Web School, we train people like you to help farmers transition away from using chemicals to farming in harmony with nature by restoring the soil food web. For more information about the numerous benefits of the Soil Food Web and how you can get involved, visit SoilFoodWeb.com. Okay, well, what did you think? <laughs> all right, there's a lot more of these videos that uh, address all kinds of questions. So uh, I've included a, uh, the links to these other videos so you can satisfy your curiosity further. All right. So what I want to do now is talk about some of nature's biological systems that form the basis behind regenerative agriculture. And so the video already alluded to uh, nature's barter system. It didn't actually call it a barter system. But if you look at this picture, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid the words on the left-hand side for the moment, just focus on the picture here. And so what's going on here? Have I managed to find a tree with the roots exposed that's got cakes and cookies all over it? No. What does this indicate? Well, you've heard of photosynthesis, and you're aware probably that in photosynthesis, the plant takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from its roots. Through photosynthesis, it combines those into sugars. And the interesting thing about sugars is that they contain stored sunlight energy. So the sunlight energy that goes into photosynthesis, some of that is captured, and it's stored in the carbon bonds of the sugars. Carbohydrates are long chains of carbons, hydrogen, oxygen. 
And so they're like little batteries. Now, that energy is used by the plant to grow the plant. But it turns out, and this has come out of this soil biology revolution, that up to 40% of these carbon compounds are released from the plant roots to attract and feed the microbes. So they're putting out all these sugars right around the root system, and that's bringing in all these microbes. And the sugars are like the batteries. They have already batteries that the microbes use to carry out their recycling operations and their mining operations. So that's one way of thinking it. And for the microbes, they're like cakes and cookies. So I particularly made this picture up here so that when you walk away, you will probably now look at the next tree and say, I don't see the cakes and cookies, but I know they're there. <laughs> All right. So, uh, interestingly enough, we see the cakes and cookies in the leaves as well, right? So they're not just releasing them from the roots, but even through the stomata of the leaves. There's a purpose for that, because that attracts the microbes. And of course, if this plant grows up in healthy soil, as it's coming up, it's picking up these microbes anyway. And these microbes, they attach themselves to the leaves and stems and other parts of the tree using biotic glues that they, they convert the sugars into these biotic glues and they can just stick to the leaves. And so these biotic glues, you can't remove easily. If you just wash an apple or wash some lettuce, you're not removing them. They're stuck on there. So every time you eat an apple from a healthy tree, you're in fact repopulating your biome, your gut biome. And coverage of this, these biotic glues is so complete that basically a pest can't really get to the underlying leaf. It is part of the protection system that nature's evolved. I just thought you'd like to see uh, some images of these sugars being released from the plant root. So this is two frames of a movie which shows the sugars emerging from the plant roots. So that's what's going on under the ground. And that's to attract and feed this amazing population of microbes, which are really the major workforce underground. And we want to work with them, partner with them, so that they can do most of the work in growing our food. Here's another interesting thing that emerged in Scientific American in 2015. This is a shot taken through a microscope of a polis bit of rock. And you'll see these tracks. Those are the tracks of the microscopic fungal hyphae secreting organic acids and burrowing into the rock and basically extracting all the elements the rock is made of, pipelining that back to the rest of the fungus. And many of these fungi are connected to plants, so it goes right back to the plant. So anything the rock's made of, it can get at. Now, bacteria can do much the same sort of thing, but it has to work on the surfaces. This is really remarkable. And according to the Scientific American article, the order of magnitude calculations they can do indicate this is the world's largest mining operation. It's carried out naturally by fungi. This is all part of nature's clever operating system. Here's another interesting example called a mycorrhizal fungal network. We're trying to grow the same plant in both situations. So on the left, we just have the basic dirt, the mineral substrate of Earth. So biology is being killed off. On the right, we have the same plant growing in healthy, vibrant soil. And it's got this fungal network attaching to the roots, extracting nutrients of water by typically around 700 times. This is what mycorrhizal fungal networks do. So if you are trying to grow in dirt and there's a drought or there's a shortage of nutrients in the local area, you can't compete with this situation which nature wants to provide you with. Quite commonly in industrial agriculture, fungicides are applied and that of course wipes this out. Furthermore, plowing is a very common part of regular agriculture and you're just tearing up these fungal networks. So, the other thing to notice about that is through the work of researchers like Professor Suzanne Samard of the University of British Columbia, we now know that fungal networks can link plants together in a wood wide web, allowing them to exchange signals as well as nutrients. 
amazingly sophisticated. We think we know it all, but uh, I think we just don't know what we don't know. <laughs> so I've only been able to show you in this limited time frame a few of the biological systems that we are calling upon to do regenerative agriculture. But interestingly enough, we can encapsulate the knowledge we've learned about these biological systems into a set of six principles, which we call the six principles of regenerative agriculture. And so what are they? Limit soil disturbance. Well, you can guess you're going to be tearing up all these fungal networks if you are plowing all the time. Protect the soil surface. Build diversity. Keep living roots in the ground integrate animals, and context matters. So I don't have the time to go through all of this, but again, you can review that, and it's all discussed in my book. Okay, so these are the six principles that we're using at Grafton Commons. And you could use in your garden. Or if you have a friend who's a farmer, point them to Dr. Ingham's animations. So I have another video I'd like to show, one of my favorites. It's called The Soil Story. It nicely makes the link between climate change and food security and soil carbon. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well, now there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same.
well, even though carbon is part of CO2 that is a greenhouse gas when it's in the atmosphere, the film makes the point that carbon is not really the enemy. All life on Earth is carbon-based, and it's a matter of balance. So this leads me to an interesting quiz. The background behind this is that in 2018, a group of scientists published an interesting paper, which is referenced at the bottom there, where they looked at how the planet's carbon-based life is distributed among different life forms. So here are the life forms on the bottom. Item one are insects, fish, mollusks, livestock, humans, birds, and other animals. Basically everything that you can see, the animals you can see. Item two are plants, and item three are the microbes. It can only be seen in a microscope. So what do you think goes in the first box? The first box hosts 82.5% of the carbon mass of life forms. Number three. Number two. How many for three? How many for two? Well, uh, some of you are right. <laughs> two, plants. They, they host 82.5%. So what's next? Three. Three. I'll put you out of your misery. So it is microbes. So they constitute 17.1%. And then the other life forms that we're all familiar with, 0.4%. Wow. That just shows you how much we are underestimating the things we don't know, which are the things we don't typically see. OK, so let's turn to Bowen Island. The last thing you're going to see is a short video that I made with my drone uh, showing Grafton through the season of 2021. Oh, cool. And you'll get to see all our volunteers that we had that year. So this is a project that BIF started managing in May 2020. It, it's, it's part of the Grafton development around Grafton Lake. The deal is that when they're finished with the development, the developers plan to give this land to a suitably constituted community organization that can manage this in a financially viable way. So no one really knows what that group is going to be. At the moment, BIFS is managing. And lots of people are saying great things, you know, saying good work, uh, we think this is a good thing to do. And uh, can we economically manage this in a viable way? We're, we're not absolutely sure about that. As long as we're volunteers, yes. And we don't have any huge debt to cover. We market straw. We, that's one of the ways we make some income. We bring in organic straw. We needed it, so we brought it in. Actually, Jackie started this at our garden before we started managing the Grafton Garden. She brought in from Agassiz a whole truckload of straw, and I thought she was crazy. But people loved it, and, you know, they sold it. And she's the garden mentor, so we need somebody like that to think big. Anyway, that's one source of income. We also do sell produce at Farmer's Market. And now you realize how it's being grown, too, right? Cool. So the new thing this year is we're, uh, we're building a second shed. Again, it's being built by volunteers, people that have some skills in this area. We, we provide the materials or pay for the materials and they, they build it. Now, to give you a bit of background before I go into the shed, back in 1992, Bob Turner and Will Husby made a map of what they thought Bowen Island would have looked like back in 12,500 years ago. And at that time, the sea level was higher. The road that we currently cross the island on was underwater. It didn't exist, of course. And so where Grafton Commons is, is right here. So we were a sandy beach. And if you dig down into our land, within a foot, you're in solid sand. So we cannot just simply grow in fertile soil from day one. We have to basically create our own soil. But isn't that typically the story of a lot of Bowen Islanders? They may just have rock, and they might have a flat spot. So they could do what we're doing. And, and so what we're doing is we're building lasagna beds. So we're having to create our own organic material and build up a naked soil. 
So Jackie here is working, in this case, with uh, students from the IDLC, this school on island. We had to get all the materials together ahead of time. I think Hassan was cutting grass for us at that time, and so we had a big pile of freshly cut grass, and then we had uh, lots of bags of leaves. So what you need to do is you lay down some cardboard, about half inch thick, all overlapping, so sunlight can't get through, and then you uh, pile layers on top of that. The first layer is a, a high nitrogen uh, organic matter layer. So cut grass, freshly cut grass would correspond to high nitrogen. And there are others, high nitrogen items, but uh, I, there's a more detailed page that follows this. If you're, any of you are wanting to follow up, you can read that and get more details. And so then on top of that, you put a thicker layer of low nitrogen organic material, which would be the leaves and wood chips. And then you can repeat that process and go up and up and up and up, bearing in mind that you know eventually it will collapse to about one quarter of that thickness. And then on top of that, you put about two inches of topsoil, uh, which you're going to grow in, and you can have compost in that as well, and uh, you know composted compost, and then plant your seeds in there, and then cover it with straw. Now, the action, if you do this in the fall, the action of the high nitrogen material interacting with the low nitrogen material will actually generate heat. And we put in a little bit of super high nitrogen stuff on it as well, just to juice it up a little bit. And for that, we use what are called spent grains. So in the beer making operation, uh, what you do is you take barley grains, you extract the carbohydrates, and what's left over is almost pure protein, which is very high nitrogen. And so you can just sprinkle that on top of the greens or on top of the browns and as you're building it up. And that'll rev up the temperature a bit. And it'll compost a bit more rapidly. So this is something anybody can do. We've had four workshops on lasagna bed building. Keep your eyes open. You may want to sign up for the next one. And we also add what we call compost extract, where you extract the, the microbes from the compost with a special composted tea bag. And then putting that in a bucket of water. And then you massage the tea bag. And so that is usually loaded with good balance of microbes. And you can spray it on the soil. You've uh, inoculated the soil this way. OK, so. So much for that. Here's. Uh, hmm? Is this in your book too? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, this particular slide isn't. This is from another presentation. That if you if you click on this link here when you have the PowerPoint, it'll take you to that presentation. It's all about uh, how to achieve continuous no-till organic farming. So there are some details in here which you might find interesting. So here are our volunteers, our four volunteers to date. Jamie Arnold, Brent O'Malley, and Rob and Shelley Tompkins that have got the shed to the point where the window's in, the roof is shingled, the door is ready to go up. We, we need a rotor. A rotor. A rotor, that's it. Anyway, Rob and Shelley didn't have one, and they're off now uh, on a trip. Uh, but they promised when they get back they're going to put the door on. But we still have the, the soffits and the siding to do. And then we're pretty, well, and we need steps to get into it. So if you know anybody or you happen to have any skills in that department um, and want to volunteer, it's not too big a job. Most of the hard work's being done. So what about future projects? Well, part of this big vision is to increase our ability to grow more food and grass. After all, we're all about food resilience. And being on an island, we, we, we want to get started. We want to help educate other people to convert more of their ideas of growing flowers to including some vegetables as well. And um, really like to give them heads up on regenerative agriculture and the microbes. So education is a big part of what we're doing. But we're also trying to ramp up what we can achieve as, as volunteers. Way off in the distant future, maybe when the price of food is a factor three higher than it is now, you know, we might be able to afford a farmer to really make this go in a big way. 
but at the moment that seems a little out of reach. In a recent study sponsored by Thrive, Quantum Polytech University recommended that we at Grafton acquire a greenhouse to accomplish some of our goals. We'd like to grow seedlings on site. We'd also like to be able to grow other things that require protection from the wind and uh, need generally a longer season. We've estimated the project at around $25,000. In part, that's based on a recent quote for a 40 foot by 12 foot greenhouse produced in BC and is to be assembled at Grafton. So the price includes the assembly as well. Now we're a registered society, but are not a charitable organization. And as a result, we are not eligible for most of the grants that come our way. So we are looking for volunteers to chant in this project. I'm now going to show you the drone video, and then we'll end with a big list of ways you can volunteer if you're so inclined. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What's the proper name of your society? Oh, and I'm Food Resilience Society. And who's the contact? We do have a web page, and there's all kinds of information on that web page. It's bowenfoodresilience.ca. Here we have an email address uh, that should be on that site, and a whole lot of resource material. And at Rotary, you know our own website. There is a page about this talk which has that link on it. It'll be a permanent part of our site, so you can always go there and find out about this talk at that link. Very good. Okay, so let's watch this video. It's seven minutes long. I hope this doesn't run us over, but...
shows the garden different times of the year. Wow. Pretty fantastic. Phil, did you design the circular layout of the Commons Garden? No, actually, we took on the gardens in May 2020. Before that, there was another team that was managing the gardens, and they conceived of the circular layout. So we took on what they had done and carried on. We've managed so far to keep going. This video was taken during the COVID year, and so we actually had a lot more volunteers that year than we had this year because people were more available. Now, Ravia Wilcox in the back and Susan Swift, they produced a book. Going through during the that's, pandemic. That's available in the library. And actually, my book is available as well. As I promised, our occupations for volunteers. <laughs> Are you looking for a community of like-minded individuals wanting to create a healthier planet and contribute to food resilience on our island? We're looking for people. So maybe you'll find something on that list. What do you do to support and train volunteers? So it depends. We work in the garden. We teach you and train you as we work together. We hope you'll want to be magic because not many people come equipped to understand the principles of regenerative agriculture, and we want to impart that knowledge. To champion the Greenhouse Project, perhaps somebody here in your community feels like it'd be a great thing to contribute to fundraise for the money. Uh, to help with building projects, well, obviously you need to have some skills. To repair fencing uh, tools or do small construction projects like an owl box, Maybe quite a few of us can do that without too much need or support. To assist with the irrigation system, so far I've looked after the irrigation system, but there's much more we could do in that department. Do you have a well in power? We have a well, we have power. Uh, so, for example, we have to shut off the. Um, this is going to be a bit of an issue when we have the greenhouse, because we'd like to have water accessible to the greenhouse in the spring and in the late fall. And at the moment, the pump we have is not deep enough to make that feasible. It wouldn't be a great distance to get to the greenhouse, but we'd have to have a shutoff valve that shuts it off below the ground so that it's not going to freeze. But we'd like to not have to transport water jugs to water the seedlings, for example, in the very early spring. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, getting down to here, well, for all of these, basically, you'll have somebody mentoring you. Organizing the leaf collection and storage of the garden. Anybody could do that. The, the only essential thing is we, we want clean leaves. We don't want pieces of plastic and pieces of steel, because we, we end up having to shred them before we can put them on the lasagna beds or into the compost. I got some bags of leaves donated one time, and they were nice and dry, so I laid them out on a flat piece of ground, and then I took the electric lawnmower and ran over it. Pring! <laughs> There's a metal shot out, and doggy bags in there. There was a yeah, good selection of garbage. How do you handle uh, invasives, like anything from ivies to blackberries to bamboo? What have, what have they got in your project? My answer? Yeah. Well, very sweet. It has a root that will reproduce from the root if you just have plant off, then we pull it out. But if the root will not reproduce, you can leave the root in the soil. So we have horse tail, tons of horse tail. They'll never get rid of it. So we are learning to live with it. So I mean, I could say a lot about it, but that would be something we could learn about if wanted. And we definitely have the blackberry trailers all over the place. We've got this massive root puller an extractigator, but it can't, even the bigger trees, it can't do that, but it, and then some things that are considered invasives, like comfrey, we use under it to build soil, we have a lot of uh, buttercup. The green parts we use to compost, and we've experimented with putting out roots of things like blackberries to dry out in the sun and die, and then put it in the compost, and that seems to be working. I think for a lot of people, the concept of regenerative gardening is new. 
but it seems as if there's a great deal that's established. But I would imagine that there's ongoing research, and if somebody who's been involved with research, where is it going next? What, what are the big things that people are looking at and trying out and experimenting with? Right. One small thing that uh, Dr. Hinn's group has been doing is looking at a low ground cover of clover, certain types of clover that are not as invasive, and they don't grow very high, and so you can plant in with them. I don't know a lot about that, but that's one of the things that they were working on. Sort of a living mulch? Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of work where you plant a cover crop and don't really want to have to plow to get rid of it. So they're using uh, what are called roller crimpers. Imagine you have a tractor and you have a drum and it's got blades around the drum. And so what you can do is you can go into uh, a field that's got your cover crop in it and it rolls it down and then crimps it so it can't come back up. And when you see this thing in operation, it looks just like a carpet. It just completely covers the ground. It's all lined parallel. And so behind, at the back of the tractor, you have a, uh, a seeding machine. And it cuts a very narrow groove into that carpet and then plants directly into it. And so now the cover crop, which would have been a problem, you might have had to till it to get rid of it, is now your, your mulch lying on the ground protecting you from weeds growing up. It seems to work really well. It's been around for a while, but there's still new pieces of equipment being designed and built for that. There's small versions of that, like a yeah. lawnmower, which you could use in a garden, right? Yeah. And, and you can even you make can your even own. You can make one with a piece of wood. Yeah. You, you can take a piece of wood, which has a sharp edge on the bottom of it. It could be just a sharp or piece of wood below it. And then you have ropes, and you just simply go like this. <laughs> now, another thing which is really interesting, though, has to do with the, the microbes. Now, if you're going to grow organically, you can't use the conventional fossil fuel-based fertilizer, so you have to use some sort of compost basis. And, of course, compost typically has a lot of microbes in it. But you need one to two tons of compost for each acre. Because they were talking about at least half an inch uh, everywhere. So then along came compost extract, where you can extract the microbes from the compost in water with a compost tea bag, and then you can spray it you can direct the spray to be where the plants are. Because as you know, the root exudates that feed the microbes are all coming out from the plant root. So if there's a lot of bare ground, it's a waste of, of good microbes because they need those, those exudates, those sugars, to function properly. Using compost extract in this way reduces the compost required to a few pounds per acre. So then the next step is, okay, well, instead of making compost extract, we can make compost tea. And so what you do is you have a tank of water that is constantly aerated. You load it up with microbes out of the compost tea bag, and you put in some food for the microbes now. So now you can grow your microbes. You can make any amount of the equivalent of compost extract, but now it's called compost tea. And so your starting point was hardly any compost at all. An even cleverer idea than that, what you can do is you can soak your seed before you plant in compost extract. On the farm, that seed can be put into the ground mechanically, so they have to be dry. But if you're just doing it in your garden, you don't have to dry them at all. That seed has got a head start. It's been inoculated with the mycorrhizal fungi, it's been inoculated with good bacteria, now, we're not specifically trying to select particular bacteria or particular fungi. I know you can buy particular ones. Nature is extremely complex, and so, you know, a gram of healthy soil, if you do a DNA analysis of the, the different species of bacteria and fungi there, they're like hundreds of thousands. So, if you think you're going to do it with one, the magic one that somebody's trying to sell you, you might be missing out on the essential stuff. 
So but by soaking in the extract, you now inoculate that seed, it goes in the ground, and it's the most efficient delivery of the microbes to the thing that's going to be producing root exudates and, and feeding. And then it can spread that to any other plants that uh, you put in. You know, I think this is an ongoing story here on Long Island. So you're going to have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> This has been very informative, and I see people nodding their heads all the way around the room. Yes, uh, I've been fascinated every time I drive by. I'm like, well, what's going on over there? You know? <laughs> and I've seen bits because uh, I had read about the lasagna beds and that kind of thing. I think this is important to all of us. I care a lot about the food that I eat. I care about the security of food for Canadians, anyhow. And I know that as a community and as a civilization, we need to rethink where the food comes from. I, I saw some real hope for the future tonight, and I'm very grateful to you for coming and talking to me. Thank you very much.